So which step is most significant to establishing federal supremacy over the states? The Constitution itself, the Civil War, the 14th Amendment that I kind of put together, uh, the New Deal and fiscal federalism, or modern civil rights, okay? Now, our lecture for today is on civil liberties. Uh, civil liberties are the personal rights and freedoms that the federal government and state governments and local governments, because of the 14th Amendment, cannot abridge either by law, constitution, or judicial interpretation. In other words, what it says is this, these are inherent rights. These are the rights that Jefferson talks about in the Declaration of Independence, right? These are the things that make us human, okay? These are limits specifically in the Bill of Rights on the power of government to restrain or dictate how individuals act. There are limits on the power of government. So specifically when we talk about civil liberties, Civil liberties are going to place limits on government, right? Not on individual businesses. For example, a lot of times when we talk about things like Twitter, right? Can you get banned from Twitter for saying something? Yes, yes. you can. Why can Twitter do that? Yeah? I heard the comment. What? It's a private entity, right? It's a corporation. The government doesn't own it. Okay? Facebook can ban you or take down what you put up. Okay? Newspapers do not have to print your letters to the editor. These are private entities and they can censor, but the government cannot censor them. All right? So there are, these are limits on the power of government, not of individuals. The Bill of Rights, which we're going to spend, I wish, more time on, but sadly, basically today and Monday on. These are, there's first of all the debate of the necessity of them as the Constitution mentioned. And the framers of the Constitution were kind of like, hey, look, we have already limited government so much. What with the power of states? What with um, you know the ability of people to um, uh, to have their own say and you know all these checks and balances? So we don't think the federal government is going to trench on anybody's rights. The anti-federalists said what? The people who were opposed to the Constitution, the anti-federalists said what? What did they say? They said what? What did the anti say about the need for a bill of rights? Yes, the answer is yes. The anti are going to say, yes, we do need one, right? The framers, the federalists are going to say, we don't need one, it's fine. We have lots of other protections. The anti federalists are going to say, hey, look, you know, this isn't working. You have to put a Bill of Rights in the federal constitution as well. The first through eight are going to guarantee specific rights and liberties. They're going to say government can't do this. I'm going to talk about the First Amendment today and only the First Amendment. The, the, <laughs> the Ninth Amendment states that other rights exist. It just says, hey, so we didn't name them all because you know, there's stuff we haven't thought about or things that haven't developed yet, okay? And the 10th Amendment says, hey, anything that is not reserved by the federal government as a power is a power that's kept by the states and the people respectively. That's what the 10th Amendment says, okay? So the Bill of Rights are these first 10 amendments to the Constitution. The First Amendment is going to be our focus today. And the first, first Amendment says, Congress shall make no law. That's how it starts. Okay? 
with the 14th Amendment and incorporation, which we talked about last week, you can read this as governments shall make no law or rule or act. Okay? Respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I just want you to know that right away in the First Amendment, we have a contradiction. Right? And we're going to find a tremendous amount of case law in this area itself. Establishment of religion. Can the government establish a religion? Can it make any law that would go toward establishing a religion? Can government actors do things to establish religion? Can government actors have freedom of religion? Oh, yeah. So suddenly, Right? We have a little bit of a conflict, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble, or to petition their government for redress of grievances. That's a lot of stuff. Okay? In one amendment. No establishing a religion. No prohibiting the free exercise of religion. No abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble or of the right of the people to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's six, all in one, right? This is why it's Eric's favorite. It's not five, it's six freedoms. It's six, not five, right? They're separate. So let's talk about the first amendment. When we talk about the First Amendment, we have Thomas Jefferson writing to, um, at, at this time, the Baptists were a major religion that had a tremendous amount of power, correct? Okay. Yes. No, they didn't, right? They were a weird little sect that um, were concerned about government overreach. <laughs> from other religions into their religion. And Thomas Jefferson writes a letter to the Baptist Assembly, and he says, hey, I think there ought to be a wall of separation between church and state. And so when we talk about separation between church and state or a wall of separation, we're really referring to this idea of how Jefferson interprets this provision in the First Amendment. Now, is Jefferson qualified to speak on the First Amendment? Somewhat. I mean, he wrote it with Madison, right? And Madison also says, hey, I think this is what it ought to be too. But they think so for very different reasons, okay? Jefferson thinks so. Because Jefferson is a deist. You know what that means? What's it mean? What's it mean? Absolutely. Jefferson believed that there was a higher power, but not necessarily aligned with a particular religion. You know, believed that there was a creator, right? But you know, the, the relationship between that and organized religion, uh, Jefferson didn't believe in that. He would rip pages out of his Bible because he wouldn't believe in certain uh, portions of it. Uh, that's true. And, and so he ripped pages out of his Bible because he didn't believe in certain portions. He also rewrote, there's actually a Jeffersonian New Testament in which he just takes out everything that is divine in nature and says, hey, this is a pretty good way to live. Right? That's Jefferson. Right? Not particularly religious. Okay. Madison, on the other hand, religious? Anyone? Okay. Very religious. He and Jefferson are very good friends. And Madison's very devout, but he also believes there should be a separation between church and state. 
for Jefferson because he says, hey, when government gets together with religion, then that's when we violate people's individual liberties the most. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, right? Madison says, hey, that's a problem, sure. But my big problem is this. My religion is between me and God. And so when politics gets involved in church, when we talk about power in there with faith, then it corrupts religion. And I don't want that to happen. Okay? You see the two different viewpoints and why they're coming down on the same side? Okay. Well, over time, even though Madison Jefferson did write the first movement, their perspective of this idea of a wall of separation of church and state has not been what has been held by the Supreme Court. Oh, this is the last. Hello. So, this is the Lemon Test. In Lemon versus Kurtzman in 1971, the Supreme Court said. <laughs> to be constitutional, an act of government or by a government official must. And I often ask about the limit test. I don't, we'll see. We'll see what we do this time. It must have a secular purpose. What's a secular purpose? A reason to do it that isn't religious in nature. Now, can it also have a religious reason? Yeah, absolutely. Can you have a Christmas parade? Yes. Okay. What reason is secular for a Christmas parade? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. In other words, commerce. We're going to sell some stuff. Come on down to Main Street. We'll leave the doors open. You can buy it. Right? Not only that, but less cynically, community spirit, gathering together. Right? And so it has a secular purpose. Okay. Secondly, it can neither advance nor inhibit religion. Okay. So if you have a Christmas parade and you do not allow religious or non religious groups, if you do not allow religious groups that are not Christian groups, or if you do not allow non religious groups in the parade, can you do that? No, you can't, okay? And you can't do it for a reason, okay? If you only allow Christian groups to be in the Christmas parade, then clearly it is no longer what? <laughs> Secular, and you are advancing a religion. If you don't allow uh, the Baha'i group on campus to be in the religious parade, then you are inhibiting religion. It also means that you can't do things like if a Christian church wants to sing Christmas carols that are religious in tone while they're what, mar marching down the street or on their float or whatever, you can't stop them from doing that. You cannot inhibit religion, but you also cannot advance it. In other words, it needs to be open to all. Okay? The third is this. No excessive government entanglement with religion. And the limit test comes about because in the 1960s, uh, after Brown versus Board of Education, which we'll talk about next week, um, the Supreme Court and the executive branch says you must desegregate all public places to include specifically right and so what happens in a lot of states are uh, there are lots of white parents who take their children out of school and put them into private schools and then say oh it's so expensive state won't you pay for it and the state says of course we'll pay for it and the Supreme Court says no you won't these schools are based on religious instruction. That is advancing religion. That's using state funds to do that. You cannot do that. Okay. 
But in 2022, this summer, Carson versus Macon is decided by the Supreme Court. In Carson, Carson versus Macon, the Supreme Court required that Maine give money to religious private schools if it gives money to any private school. What does that do to the living test? Like I said, my expert just come in here. It squeezes it? It may squeeze it a bit. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Requires money, uh, Maine to give money to private religious schools. Now, Maine anticipated the direction of the Supreme Court. And uh, part of what they required was that there be non discrimination for any school that they gave money to. And the private religious schools said, no thanks, we're still going to discriminate. We won't take your money. In 1980, the Lemon case invalidated a Kentucky law requiring the posting of the Ten Commandments in public school classrooms. Is that happening right now? Yeah. In 2005, uh, again in Kentucky, uh, there's a Kentucky courthouse where there is a, a giant fight of these uh, uh, Ten Commandments that were posted. <coughs> And at the same time, there was a question about the Ten Commandments on the Texas state ground. Yeah. It's a good question. Hold on to that for one second. Okay. So, um, because this actually will help you understand that, all right? Ten Commandments outside Kentucky courthouse, but it's fine on the Texas state ground. The Supreme Court says the difference is this. This was the only monument in the courthouse. Now they did kind of put up some other things on the walls, like in a back thing later, but they said it's pretty clear that you did this after the fact, right? And it's not equal. And it's pretty clear that there's a direction of law. Now uh, Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore, who also was had the same faith, uh, writes on this and he says, um, hey, that's okay because I followed the law of God before I followed the law of the state. Right? And they said, you can't do that. You're the Supreme Court Chief Justice. That means that there is not justice under the law. Do you guys know what the Ten Commandments say? One of my favorite parts of this ruling is this. Um, one of the briefs says, um, well, the Ten Commandments is just a secular guide to how to behave. So what does the Ten Commandments say? Because that seems to know. So the first one is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Not particularly secular, right? Okay. But to your question, which is a very good question about in God we trust, okay? In Texas, on the state capitol ground, the Supreme Court's going to say, this is different because there's lots of monuments and it's about the culture of the people. Okay, and so to have something that respects the culture, that's more of a freedom of religion idea. You also have things on the Texas State Capitol grounds, like, you know, a giant statue of Sam Houston. You have um, the Spanish uh, um, Constitution. Okay, and so you have some other things that are there. That's just a, a few of them that come to mind for you. And so it's just one of the many things that are there. It's not sitting in front of a court of law. Okay. And so 
this accommodation idea is basically this. We are people with freedom of religion. And therefore, it can be expressed in ways that are public. Okay, yeah. Um, I was just curious, like the third act, was there anything, was that like okay? That is like you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I know what the CARES Act is, but it's, ask the question that's just a little different. Um, so, like with PPP money, uh, the protection for employees, churches were able to apply for government funds to pay their employees. Yeah, like my, I, I, I was able to get money from that. And, and the Supreme Court has another case, which we're not going to talk about right now because this is not a, but this constitutional law case, a uh, constitutional law class called Civil Rights and Civil Liberties that you might find really interesting. But there's another case where the Supreme Court says you cannot discriminate, and this is kind of where they're going with Carson, but you know, there's some question there. You cannot discriminate against an institution whenever you're giving out money in a non-religious way. Does that make sense? So you can't discriminate against a religious group whenever you're giving out money um, to everyone. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. Uh, the other case I'm talking about has to do with um, playground materials, right? So at a church figure, but it's a good question. Uh, and actually, if you look at a lot of the PPP loans, a lot of them did go specifically to churches. And you can, you can look at our open records. Um, so this is where the Supreme Court's kind of come down on this. Now, we have a, another case. At the same time, we have uh, in the 1960s, we have a case, Ingalls versus Vitalis. Anybody tell me what Ingalls versus Vitalis? <coughs> Teachers cannot lead prayers in school. Okay, Ingle works by that. And so this is kind of following on that. Uh, why can't teachers lead prayers with um, sophomores in high school? Yes. Because if they have to do their religion, they're still going to um, pray with them because they don't want to bad their Okay. <laughs> It may not be their religion, but they're going to feel coerced to pray with them because they don't want to give a bad grade, right? And also because maybe that's what the majority of people are doing. So peer pressure, right? And so there are two kind of issues here. One is the government establishing a religion, right? And the second is how much, how many rights of privacy, which we're going to talk about on Monday, do parents have in raising their own children? Right? Hey, I want my child to follow this religion and you're using this prayer. I have a problem with that. Right? Okay. So, most recently in the summer as well, we have Kennedy versus Bremerton. Maybe overruling limits. Maybe overruling limits. Coaches can pray at the 50 yard line. During the time of their duties, which are clearly defined until the team leave the locker room or get or, or off the bus, invite team members, opposing team, and the public to pray while the fight song is being played. This is the coach with his helmet in the air, sitting off of the <coughs> giving a release speech to players at the 50 yard line. Supreme Court 6 3 decision says this is all about private religious expression and freedom of speech. There's no court. They specifically say that a government official can, during their duties, engage in religious prayer and exhortation. And that is part of their religious freedom. What do you guys think? Ask questions there. You can write it down. You don't have to tell me. But I want you to think about that. These two cases were handed down this summer. 
the the FOMI limits have been exited now, which is supposed to come right now with my animation. So I have to work on that. The free exercise of religion. The free exercise of religion. <laughs> Government cannot interfere with religious practice, but they have also said this is not absolute, right? In many other cases. Oftentimes, when it conflicts with establishment of religion, right? Government officials, though both of these cases seem to walk that back quite a bit. Several religious practices, however, have been ruled not to have constitutional protection. To include snake handling by minors, polygamy, restriction of medical care to minors and the use of illegal drugs. So let's talk about one, three, and four first. In each of these cases, the court's interest is in the protection of minors. They say there's an overriding state interest that regardless of the parents or the child's sincerely held religious beliefs until they reach the age of majority, then state concerns about health override that. What about vaccination? What about vaccination? What's the state interest of people being vaccinated? Anyone? Yes. No, I'm not talking about the state as a conceivable I mean the state as a government. What's government's interest? In having vaccination, yeah. Um, to make sure you're vaccinated. Okay, so if you're vaccinated, you're going to be more protected, you're going to be healthier. And if everyone is vaccinated, what happens? We don't have Less diseases. diseases. Yeah. What diseases aren't running rampant around everywhere, killing people. things like polio disappear, but it's coming back, but it's coming back, smallpox eradicated. Right? We're killing people left and right. Okay? No longer eradicated. The government's interest was in the health of the people, right? But also in the people as a whole, right? Because the idea is, is that if people are vaccinated, then that keeps the disease from spreading that gets past that vaccination level. Are vaccinations 100%? No, but if everyone's 100% vaccinated, what happens? The disease doesn't spread. The disease doesn't spread, right? It becomes more and more difficult, it gets isolated, et cetera, right? And so when we think about the vaccination issue, we're talking about specifically people are saying, hey, look, I have an extension to vaccination because of religious freedom, right? Supreme Court has said, in terms of minors, we're not going to let you handle poisonous snakes to prove your religion because that is dangerous for you. We're not going to let 12-year-olds uh, marry into a family with three other wives and a 60-year-old husband because we think that's dangerous for you. We're not going to allow your parents to not let you have medical care, like a blood infusion, even though that's your sincerely held medical uh, uh, religious belief, because the state interest overrides that in protecting the minor. Now, after the age of 18, you can make those choices, right? Schools require kids to get vaccinated because children are gross. Okay? 
They really are. They're always slobbering on each other, right? Their fingers are in everything, okay? I mean, they're cute, but they're dirty. And so they require this so that things don't spread, okay? Protection of mites, that's the idea. So I want you guys to think about that in terms of vaccination. The other is the use of illicit drugs. In Oregon B. Smith, what happens is this. Smith is a drug counselor for the state of Oregon. He is also a member of the Native American Church. What do you guys know about the Native American Church? Yes? No? Founder is Quan Parker. Anybody know about Quan Parker? Okay, Quan Parker is the last Apache chief, uh, last Comanche chief. Okay. And uh, while in battle with uh, U.S. forces in the in, in Fort the West, actually, um, he is injured, and his uh, he's he breaks his leg, and so the healer, the medicine man, uh, gives him some peyote and says, "Hey, take this. Go somewhere else till I fix your leg." Right? That's what peyote does. Take it somewhere else. In your mind, at least. And so. Um, he does that, and in that, Father Parker sees a vision of Jesus, and he says, hey, there ought to be a Native American church that it uses vision quests, using peyote, to be able to talk to God. And Father Parker bases a church, creates a church, based upon this idea, the use of vision quests, <laughs> seeking out what God's will. Okay? But, you know, this is a church that's been around for, at this point, 150 <coughs> years almost, right? So in Oregon versus Smith, Smith's a member of the Native American church. He uh, goes to a sweat log, he ingests peyote um, in a religious exercise. And then he is tested because he is working for the state of Oregon. He has positive for peyote, so he is fired. <clears throat> the state of Oregon says, you can't do that. That's, that's actually sincerely held religious people. The U.S. Supreme Court, however, says that the national interest in stopping the drug trade overrides religious freedom. Okay? Free speech and press. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That does not mean that there are no limits, but freedom is a legal concept that cannot be abridged. You know, Tomsky says, if we don't believe in freedom of expression for people that we despise, for people whose ideas we cannot tolerate, cannot stomach, then we don't believe in it. If we don't believe in their right to say it, then we don't believe in freedom of speech. So, there's a couple kinds of speech that we do limit. One is obscenity. Um, the Miller test for obscenity. The average person applying contemporary community standards finds the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. Okay? So when we talk about obscenity and pornography in schools, that is what we are saying. We're saying that the work taken as a whole Applying contemporary community standards appeals to prurient interest. And the work depicts or describes in patently offensive way sexual conduct that is specifically defined and prohibited by state law. So if it talks about sex, if there's a book you're reading and there's a sex scene in the book, but that sex is not, that sex, the way that it is done, uh, is not something that is prohibited by law, then does it fail the Miller test? No. Does it? Passes, right? So there's something like sex with a goat. 
sex with a child, okay? Specifically prohibited. And the work taken as a whole lacks serious and, and work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So even if one and two, if the work taken as a whole has serious literary, scientific, political, artistic value, then it still cannot be prohibited or banned. The Miller test for obscenity. Yes, Eric? Oh, I have to ask this question. So there's this bill that the Oklahoma legislature did, 1775. And part of it is this book banning that deals with sex that little kids could read. You know, what's weird about that bill is I'm not sure it talks about sex. And so uh, what it says is we cannot talk about race, actually. But it doesn't talk about sexual activity. But people that. think it does. But people do think it does. So there's some pretty hard rules, however. There's no prior restraint. New York versus Minnesota, 1931. New York Times versus the United States, 1971. These are hard rules. What that means is no censorship. The government cannot stop you from printing, publishing, posting, saying on a soapbox thing. Now, if after the fact, it turns out that you are leaking government secrets, what can happen to you? Move to Russia. Well, you may move to Russia, but um, you will be indicted in the United States or arrested or charged, right, for those things. So political speech is protected, right? Um, but that's, I, I think that is probably something that's being tested more by the House Bill 1775 than the Miller test, the Miller test is brought up. Symbolic speech is protected. That's Texas versus Johnson. Uh, that's also Tinker. Did you guys read about Tinker versus Des Moines School District? Or see anything about that in your singing? Okay, that's high school students wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The Supreme Court clearly states that high school students have a level of freedom of political speech and through symbolic speech. Hate speech is protected. Brandenburg versus Ohio, as long as it does not rise to the level of excitement, which we'll talk about in just a second, you can say really hateful things about others and groups. And there's a higher standard to prove libel or slander if it's a public person. You actually have to show malice, okay? And understand this, truth is an absolute defense against libel or slander. If I say something about you that hurts your reputation and you sue me for slander, like the sheriff recently did um, in regard to his, uh, the Tulsa deputy sheriff, who recently said about a year ago that the cops actually don't shoot black people as often as they should. And that was reported on. And so he sued them for slander and libel and defamation. And the court said, well, you said it. Truth is an absolute defense. There are some limits on speech and press. Time, place, and manner sets public order. I cannot lead you guys in a march right now down the street uh, to protest to which it comes because I didn't get a permit, right? Lots of traffic, okay? Time, place, and manner. But they cannot deny me a permit if I ask for a permit for that purpose, okay? National security, clear and present danger, okay? A conflict with another liberty. A lot of times a, a judge will issue a gag order. He'll say, hey, you cannot talk about what's going on this, in this proceeding until afterwards, right? And so a delay, and the courts have said that's permissible to keep there from being uh, too much influence over the outcome of the trial. 
lie or flame or incitement. Incitement is whenever you incite someone to act and they physically cross a line. Okay. If I get you guys all riled up about tuition and point out that there's some sticks that I have stacked up outside with some kerosene matches and then send you to Evans Hall, right? Maybe um, the incitement, right? Obscenity the Miller test we just talked about. There are limits. There are limits. We have the right to peaceably assemble. The existence of a group or demonstration of a picket line or break is greater than the words on a sign oftentimes. And that has to do with sweat equity, the fact that we physically appear somewhere, right? Physically showing up sometimes is greater than speech, even if it's unpopular or hateful. Right, which you guys are going to talk about this week or you talked about last week in your lab. We also have the right to petition the government. This was more uh, important earlier, historically, uh, particularly Native American tribes who used this. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys uh, this next question, uh, this poll question at the beginning of class next time that I'm going to take attendance really quickly right now. Oh, is, is hate speech illegal? That question will come back. 